Welcome everyone, this is Jenkins LTS Certification Overview. Oliver, thank you very much for presenting to us. We so, so much appreciate this. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, would you like me to take this away? Yeah, if, if you'd be willing, I can, if there's something you'd like to screen share, we can certainly have you screen share. If rather you would prefer that we focus on the notes, I'm happy to screen share the notes. You tell us what, what you think would be best for conveying the information. Right, yeah, I'll definitely try. I see that you put together a quite a, little, a quite a nice list. So with you guys, I see that many of you have, have joined in the meantime. So hi, everyone. Um, so uh, uh, if some of you get some questions or remarks, I will be happy to to be interrupted at any moment and, uh, and answer those. Except for that, I would try to get, give you as much of a concise rumbling as I possibly can. Um, so the LTS certification, just, uh, just, just very briefly, um, our LTS are moving in four week cycles. Uh, we get two weeks for backporting. We get two weeks for, for, for testing and verification. Uh, actually, this is documented in its full length. So uh, let me attach, uh, let me attach a doc where this is, uh, where this is documented. So what we're going to focus on is specifically how this is certified. Um, since I am the single person that does the backporting, perhaps it would be interesting to cover in the end if we get some, some extra time, uh, because there's definitely knowledge that needs to be transferred for whoever is going to be, uh, you know, doing this uh, after I'm no longer uh, um, the release officer. Um, okay, so when it comes to certification, we are sort of following the Linux kernel model. Um, when the, you know, release candidate is being um, being made available to everyone and we get this um, mailing list uh, request for people uh, people feedback and reporting an issue as Mark you very well know because you've been contributing to this for years and years um, so we you know just inviting pretty much everyone and I'm pretty sure that CloudWiz has been working on this very hard to provide us with the feedback and actually a lot of a lot of problems was captured this way uh, by some of your colleagues. So this is the way how we are, you know, uh, receiving these from um, um, from the upstream. And at the same time, uh, for instance, for us, we've been running our internal verification based on ATH, which you know we also contributed to to these results. Same as uh, same as we encourage people to do. Um, so this is what we've been uh, what we've been doing. Uh, as I said, I will get back to the you know. Okay, so one other thing is that the, the the release officer role was not only just doing this backporting and orchestrating this um, this feedback collection, but you know keeping all this uh, all this um, all this space going, right? Since you know scheduling all these events in calendar, making sure that things happen uh, happen at a particular time, initiating new new LTS cycles, etc. So again, uh, that would I I can also cover that in case uh, that there is an interest. Um, right. So, Mark, I'm going to use your notes <laughs> to, you know, keep me on track. Um, so where does the LTS certification process run? Uh, actually in multiple places, um, due to the distributed nature, nature of, of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Uh, it's sort of hard to get a complete picture. So we just, you know, rely on, uh, on the people to contribute the wrong results. Uh, in, in the past, I was looking for some more structured way of how to do this. In the past, we used a wiki page and it didn't work very well, uh, in my opinion. And I haven't found a better um, better tool to actually get everybody uh, who is interested and who's got some interesting result to, to report them back. So uh, we stick with a good old email. So uh, the certification runs in both our um, CI Jenkins IO uh, instance so that's where we're running the full ATH suite against the, against the LTS. Um, it's not only the, the certification, it's actually a full-blown CI. So even during backporting, we're just running the same, uh, same verification and testing. So we've got an early, back, um, early feedback uh, even before we cut the, cut the release candidate, et cetera. So this is the one place, you know, the advantage of doing this is that everybody can see the results, can investigate the failures, can, you know, uh, spot the problems, etc. So, 
um, there was a couple of ideas in the past to actually move this into one of our maybe Red Hat, maybe maybe Clovis or even some somewhere else, and to do it downstream. Though you know uh, the obvious obstacle would be that this is sort of hidden and you know not everybody got access to the results, the possibility to investigate and, and work on fixing the issues, uh, which was one of the most tedious and time-consuming part on uh, on uh, maintaining the acceptance of the harness. So. Uh, I felt really, really strongly keeping this in the upstream, uh, so we can, you know, uh, uh, lower the uh, lower the barrier for entry into, you know, getting new contributors to actually fixing and updating the tests, because that was a real, uh, a real struggle. So, yeah, so that would be the, the upstream environment where it runs, uh, and except for that, there is a, I guess, a number of internal environments. Uh, I know that the Mark and Oda are doing some. Uh, some intensive uh, exploratory testing on these, which is uh, very useful. Uh, except for that, and you know, and there's uh, some other environments I presume in Cloudbees that I don't have that much information on. Um, so speaking on the part that we've been doing in Red Hat, um, we've been testing this exclusively on OpenStack, both uh, on on the host on with actually using RHEL seven for this, or you know previous versions before that, of course. So it was, you know, tested either on, uh, on VM or into the container, the, the ATH container, not the, not the Jenkins container. So those were the two environments that we've been covering and testing this and, you know, sort of um, comparing the results with what we've seen in the upstream, what we've seen uh, internally, et cetera. Uh, because, you know, due to the complexity of, uh, of the whole test suite and, uh, and the fragility of the, of the approach of using the Selenium UI testing, those of you who play with that know what I'm talking about. So there was quite a lot of, you know, false positives and uh, and problems that wasn't really related to any, any bugs or anything. So uh, it was truly necessary to compare it, you know, between the environments and see which of the failures are real or, and which of them are not. So, um, yeah, those are the, the environments that I'm personally aware of. So Mark, you're on mute. Yeah, I, so you said virtual machines, but orchestrated by OpenStack and then also containerized. Again, orchestrated by OpenStack. Those were the two environments you were checking. Mm, well, the OpenStack was not that much involved in that simply because oh. ATH does not in, um, you know, interact with it in any way. So it just happens to be Jenkins agents running in the OpenStack. Yeah. So the point is that it, it was the VMs with the actual OS, right? Got it. Okay, so it's not in the this, the relevant thing there is the virtual machines there is to say this is an operating system, not just a Docker container insulating something from it's running directly on Red Hat Enterprise Linux seven in that case. Is that did I understand? Right. Yeah, this is what what we've been doing historically, even upstream. We've been doing this before we moved to CI Jenkins IO some wow, maybe four or five years back actually. Um, but you know. Uh, we find out that uh, the results are a lot more reliable on virtual machines than we ever get in, in the containerized world. Thank you. Okay. So maybe, uh, maybe yeah, that's a dumb question and it's getting late here. So maybe I didn't just follow Clara correctly. Are you saying that what you, what you know using the VMs and the OpenStack stack um, is something you're still doing nowadays, or was the past things before you migrated to CIGIS IO? Yeah, sorry, I, I might have misspoke. Um, in, in internally, we've been using both approaches to mm -hmm. running it on VM and actually running it on VM and inside ATH container. And what we have verified is that the pure VM approach, you know, delivered more stable and predictable results compared to the containerized, right? Um, the, the, the remark on a CI Jenkins IO was really a side note that even there some years ago, we've been using this pure, um, pure virtual machines before we moved, moved to containers. And we also, you know, observed the instability in there. Okay. Thanks. So, Olive, uh, so Bati's question, are you still running? I think I hear that, yes, you are still running. Is that likely to continue or does, is Red Hat likely to say, hey, we're going to stop running those tests internally so we will have effectively as a community lost one resource that could have found problems for us? 
That's a very good question. I mean, one of the reasons why I'm giving up on, on a release officer position is that I just cannot uh, predict my allocation. So I would definitely love to stay in loop and continue to be one of the people contributing the results, find, uh, you know, found, uh, found regression and possible problems. So I would definitely love to be that, but, you know, I prefer not to promise you something I won't be able to deliver. Right. Sure. So, so the, so in the future, Red Hat may reallocate and say, hey, we're not going to run those tests. The Jenkins project, therefore, I think is, is well advised to consider how do, we, how do we execute these somewhere publicly so that we assure we see them. Good, okay, thanks, mm. Oliver. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to allocation, I would say that the, definitely this is a lot more expensive in terms of human time rather than a, than a machine time, right? Somebody needs to be looking at it, keeping the ATH in a good shape, prone of some infrastructure issues, uh, some random glitches, incompatibilities between page objects and plugin versions. So it's a lot more expensive on that side. And I honestly cannot quite imagine the writer would say, no, no more resources for running these tests. I mean. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank question, you. though. Right. Um, so, folks, uh, once again, I'd like to encourage you guys. Any, if, if you have got any questions, just feel free to to shoot. Yeah, Oliver. Yes. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go. Oh, yeah, um, so, regarding this, uh, OpenStack and Red Hat and so on. Um, so it's still it's something that we cannot see, uh, even though, I mean, we probably we don't interact with, but we cannot see as a read-only access or, or anything like that. That's that's the problem with this, you know, downstream internal internal testing. I okay. was it James who was you know doing something quite similar inside inside CloudBase. And as I said, I've got pretty much zero information except for the fact that he sometimes reported that he found found a problem. So this was one of one of the issues and one of the reason I so I mean I, I'm a huge advocate for having this you know I call it the reference environment in the upstream where the, where the full test suite is actually being run and provides the results that are visible for everyone. Thanks. Yeah, I'm just, I'm wondering actually, so right now those days, you know, do, I, as far as I remember in the past, it's very vague now, but I think you were looking at the open source uh, on CIG and his eye or the results of ATH, but then with your expertise, you would actually know yourself what are the tests that are failing that should be considered and the one that should be ignored. So we would, I mean, we would always, as far as I remember, have ATH failing, but, you know, because of your expertise, you would know which tests should be a concern and which tests actually should not be one. Is this kind of uh, still the situation right now? Or, I mean, maybe I'm not clear. Right. Let me see if I understand that. So you're suggesting that ATH is fragile in particular tests and only the people around it has an insight what is a symptom of such problems and which tests are more fragile than the other? Somehow, yeah, I mean, and that's my bad because I should have prepared this call a bit more. But I remember that back in the days, uh, most of the time, the acceptance harness uh, executions uh, would basically be red all the time, uh, like, like never be green really, because actually mm. many tests failing, and you would be one of the rare people knowing which tests should be actual concerns and which ones are known to be failing all the time, be flaky, whatever. So not really be a concern ever, at all ever, which I think might be, if this is the case, which I'm looking right now at, uh, if it's still okay right now, might become more and more of a concern because indeed we may lose that, you know, uh, uh, expertise that's only in your brain, in your, in your expertise indeed. Uh, yeah, to know which tests are should be uh, looked into and the tests should be ignored because they've been flaky forever. Mm. That, that's a good point. Uh, in, in a sense, you're right. Uh, we never, after easily five or six years of, of effort, to actually get the ATH stabilized, which I blame for lack of time and, and the inherent nature of selenium and the fact that we are trying to verify something like, I don't know, I'm pulling numbers up from my sleeve, but something like 40 independently developed components, which, you know, maintainers not really know 
the, how it's being tested and what particular effect it's going to have. So we usually just find out if somebody has released a new version of plugin, we're changing UI a little bit, it started failing and it's sort of, sort of tedious in this way. Um, but yeah, so this is this is the part of what I what I mentioned that it requires pretty much constant attention and adjustment to to the plugin and to their UIs and to whatever specifics. So it very often happens that some test starts failing simply because uh, something have changed. Usually it's UI, but there might be different things that, that do change and it needs to be adjusted. So it's not quite that we would know that, I don't know, some small fracture of test would be just constantly broken or unfixable or just fragile. We have a ways to deal with that, uh, you know, by actually fixing them. Uh, but uh, it requires the time. It requires somebody to have a look at that. And these tests are, you know, uh, getting broken, you know, annoyingly often, so to speak. Yep. Maybe I would make sense, actually, you know, do you think it would be a good idea, maybe or especially for people who may not be uh, aware of what's going on or how it works to share what we're talking about on the screen? Because I actually opened it just now, so... I guess it might be useful, especially for people, you know, like on the recording more than us in the end, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you mean the results? Yeah, just this is just what we're talking about right now. And so if we look at the situation right now, yeah, we see indeed that we don't really often or ever have had and again, I mean, I hope it doesn't sound like a, like a reproach because that's not the case at all. I absolutely understand that we all have limited time and everything. So just to, you know, kind of make a checkpoint on this. Um, yeah, so, and what I was looking at the thing right now just a few seconds ago, and that's what I was referring to in the, the number of tests failing. And I assume that Oliver uh, knows which ones, you know, have been failing forever, which ones may be new, and so which one are probably to be looked at, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, I 100% get your point. It's uh, fair to say that it's rarely, rarely, rarely ever see to have these as 100% successful. And, you know, let, let's not lie to ourselves. Um, so, yeah, uh, you, you're right. As I said, the, the thing is that, you know, like you see a lot of, like, let's say, job DSL plugin tests are, are failing without examining closely, presumably this is because of a single problem that has, you know, broke at some point in time and, you know, needs to be looked at, adjusted the test or the plugin, but vast majority of the cases is this test. So it gets fixed, et cetera. So it's not like that this particular test would be fragile or constantly broken and it's not fixable, but it just require yeah, sure. once in a while somebody to actually adjust the test. So it ma matches the code base in, uh, in these plugins. And it's sort of a, you know, a constant struggle because of the way how this is architecture. You're trying to verify the, let's say, entire ecosystem to verify that the experience of a user that installed Jenkins with all these plugins uh, is actually going to have something functional. So in the end, you're verifying quite a lot of components, which, you know, are, how would I put it? Um, was not integrated before, right? Nobody has done any any checking on verification on that. So there is a various reasons uh, why this can break most, you know, um, prominently because they're independently developed and released by individual maintainers. Right. And so maybe an interesting question to ask to you, you know, if you had more time, uh, if you had more time, if you had like, you know, multiple people or people available or whatever, uh, what would you advise uh, people to focus on to improve the process in general, maybe improve the LTS process delivery, uh, you know, maybe the test aspects or maybe focus on the test aspect first. And maybe I was thinking yeah, maybe at the end of the meeting or something, we could ask you whether you feel the whole LTS process, what, you, what, what would you keep? What would you actually change, you know, accelerate, whatever, you know? I guess you have a lot uh, of ideas or? I love your question. Uh, actually, I put, um, uh, put a paragraph close to the end of the agenda, uh, future of LTS testing, where I got a couple of suggestions. And uh, I guess we were thinking uh, uh, quite along the same lines in the end. So would we like to you know, hop right on that or would we like to keep it on the end? I'm, I'm great with going there. I think if there's interest there, let's go there. 
I do want to, I will beg for the privilege to come back to ask specifically about tables to divs. But I think Baptiste's question is a good one. Let's go there. And then, then I'll make sure that my questions I can come back to later. <laughs> yeah, I'm I mean, fine. To be honest, I'm trying also to kind of uh, abide by the, 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 the request of Oliver, which is to ask questions to, to get going. <laughs> no, that, that's perfectly fine. I would actually suggest that we would go through the, through the rest and then we will make sure that we can have a look at this so we all have as much information about the LTS and then we can you know, potentially brainstorm and uh, spend the time on discussing the future. Um, Oliver, the, regarding the ATH, if I recall, uh, James, uh, I actually saw as well the commit. So it seems that like he's now somehow leading the project, the ATH, one way, right? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I have announced my intention to stop doing that some two weeks ago or so. Uh, before that, we've got two people that uh, from CloudBees that was helping me on this. It was... Uh, I guess we even have, have a team with it in that. So, uh, but they probably not all that active. Antonio, maybe Antonio, James, Raul, maybe. Hmm. Let me see. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. terrible with names, and I'm afraid to no get worries. them all wrong. Uh, it was Antonio for me and, and uh, for Victor actually for, for some reason. I'm sorry. Come again. <laughs> yeah, I was just uh, kind of making. A half private joke because actually Victor knows the, those people because he worked with them. So ah. the name I'm mentioning, he reminds them. <laughs> right. It was it was Antonio, and at the same time, it's girl with with one girl. But sorry, I Beatrice. I lost her name. Yeah, Beatrice probably. I don't think so. Anyway, um, there should be a team of maintainers. I was the most active was, but I know that Antonio has stepped in and pretty much as um, everywhere else in components in Jenkins, it wasn't, we haven't been very rigid or something like that. So there's a number of people that have the release permissions and been doing the releases. I remember uh, that a couple of people from CloudBase got, uh, got the release permissions. I guess, as you said, James uh, was doing one of the, definitely merging, not sure about, about releasing. Um, yeah. Actually, he did. So a couple of other people from Red Hat should have the, the release permissions at the same time. So for what makes sense to me is to have a couple of people, and that's what I try to achieve, and to a large extent I failed on that, to have a group of people that would actually be, you know, as pretty much in any component, uh, you know, permitted to merge and release the ATH as is happening, but it's, you know, fairly informal at this point. So, and... Oliver, you used the term release. Can you help me understand what does the term mean to release the acceptance test harness? Is, is it actually a version test suite? And so we go backwards and forwards with version numbers or could you give me an overview there of, of the concept? Right, another good question. Um, well, from that standpoint, the ATH got two roles. It contains the tests that actually verify the, you know, the product. Uh, but at the same time, it's a framework from composing similar tasks that can be in other components. So you can use ATH as a dependency and to use the framework and the page objects to actually write your own tests. Um, we actually use this in a couple of other plugins. Um, uh, yeah, so you can pull it and use the same mechanisms. It permits you to do the UI testing in the actual web browsers and a couple of other, uh, a couple of other features. I guess I can point you to some when this was really priceless. Um, well, actually, I don't know that you need to point that I had forgotten completely about the fact that yes, I can depend on a version of ATH and use it inside Jenkins core or inside a specific plugin. So that thanks that clarified why you do a release. Thanks very much. Okay. And, and what I can disclose is that actually we do that also at CloudBees to depend on this uh, framework to add more tests that are on the proprietary side of, of CloudBees. Yeah. Right, so well, I guess it will be for a separate topic how to actually use this in the plugin. I spent quite a, quite a lot of time putting it in a better shape some year or two ago. 
Um, but yeah, that would be for, for some for documentation effort or something like that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, just covering the rest there is, can LTS certification be run on a weekly release? Uh, not only it can, but uh, at the same time it is when uh, we're running the acceptance to harness, if I'm not mistaken, it's CI is actually running against weekly. Um, yeah, I think we run smoke tests, like the very, very small tests, subset right? mm -hmm. of, uh, no, not really like, yeah, exactly. Because smoke tests meaning the one that are like, have been qualified as really non-flaky, but it's, uh, I mean, people should be uh, kind of aware that, you know, the set is very, very limited on purpose because we don't want to be uh, it ever flaky. But yeah, probably we should actually consider, you know, fixing, deflaking what is, you know, the rest and growing this suite because in the end it makes the weeklies plus the LTS is stabler uh, over time. Mm. Yeah, it's a, a never. Right. Yeah, that's that's true. As I look at it, I see it run over thousands of tests, which I believe it feels like the entire test suite. Um, but yeah, I recall that except for the flakiness, there was also another problem, and that was the resource utilization of CI Jenkins IO, because there was quite a lot of this. Now we tested everything twice for Java 8 and Java 11. Uh, and there was this, you know, certification of LTS and this sort of CI that actually used the uh, uh, latest cores, etc. So uh, yeah, I remember that Infra team was not very happy about uh, how much resources this is using because the entire test suite takes quite a lot of time to run, and at times it's picky about the resources, but you know not uh, not using it very uh, very efficiently because this is UI testing. So um, there was another uh, another consideration there how to actually do this resource wise, and I remember that uh, as you said there was a push to use only the smoke test for this, but apparently it's not set this way in the moment, but definitely something to keep in mind. Okay, so you're thinking that, so when I look at the execution time of the master branch on ci.jenkins.io for Jenkins core, it says there that it is in fact running a um, running ATH, but it doesn't take nearly the eight or 10 hours that it takes to run ATH elsewhere. So uh, what have I misunderstood? Right. Um, yeah, so you can what- You here it's running. I, I just opened, I don't know if you see my screen. Uh, this is the Jenkins core, my star, Jenkins file. This is calling the essentials.yaml file, which is here. And then it's actually uh, running a category, the smoke disk category. This is why it's so such yeah. quicker. Okay. That's that's a good point. So, uh, Batist and Mark, you're talking about the same thing, right? So, this is the Jenkins uh, repository CI, which is actually yeah. only running the smoke tests in stable branches for LTS. I actually replace the smoke test category with every test. So, on the stable branches after backport, we're running the entire test suite. Uh, but right. what I was referring to was the CI for the acceptance test harness itself. Yeah. Right, what you talk about is a CI for for a Jenkins core. Um, so uh, let me just give you the link, and uh, that's this thing. So yeah, it's a bit um, contraintuitive, but in fact we are verifying the latest ATH against the latest core, but it's running, uh, you know, not as a part of a Jenkins core CI partially because it would be too fragile and pretty much every yeah. uh, every change would be flagged as, as broken. I, I don't remember how uh, on the top of my head how uh, the plugin versions are set and if, if they are even set, how does it work from ATH? That does it like use the whatever latest version of every per single plugins or how is this pinned? I don't remember how it works. Right. <clears throat> Uh, there's a couple of user mode. Let me try to wipe the doc. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about this. And uh, in the end, we come up with some uh, set of use cases. Oh, I have this. We call it recognized use cases for ATH. Uh, let me feed it into the, into the chat of the Zoom meeting. So we've got a couple of individual use cases and all of them require something else. Um, Presuming that you use this for testing your, your plugin, you definitely want these tests to run with the dependency versions as they are hard-coded in your POM. 
Um, so obviously you want this to be pinned, but it's not a requirement from, uh, from the ATH standpoint. Um, precisely when we are verifying LTS, we sort of want latest versions to be used from the upstream. Imagine that we release a new LTS version today. We obviously want it work for, you know, for the users or for the customers with whatever plugins version there are, right? It doesn't, it doesn't make much sense to test it with the last year's versions. I mean, it would give us more stable and predictable test suite, no question about that, but the value that we deliver to, to our users would be, would be drastically reduced. So again, this was a subject of uh, quite a lot of debates, the you know, usefulness and value delivered versus the stability and the maintenance cost. Am I making sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm just thinking that, you know, we all know how uh, hard it is to have things, you know, break suddenly from one day to another for an unrelated reason, you know. And I'm wondering whether we could have something in the middle, which is like, you know, uh, having a Palm XML or something that would pin every single version we are using in ATH, but then enable Dependabot to have a controlled uh, and constant uh, flow of updates that then would be vetted by PRs, uh, you know, and we would detect which PR, which plugin is actually making, breaking on ETH instead of bumping and then all of a sudden, because we've got 10 releases of plugins, uh, we, we see 55 failures and then 100 and so on. And then it's the end of the world and, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have to give it a, you know, more of a thought to see how this can possibly work. But, you know, car I mean, I, I can definitely describe the current state when we just uh, grab from the from the update center what is available for a given, uh, given Jenkins version, either the latest or, or the latest LTS we test. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, I guess, something uh, something to think, of, think about. Um, you know, I see some, some issues of how to actually implement that partially because, um, you know, there's a huge number of, uh, of the plugins that are involved. There's also a lot of plugins that are being installed, but not necessarily tested, right? Uh, you know, it's like, I don't know, what is J JDK tool installer? Let's presume that there are no tests for it, but it's one of the, uh, one of, well, or one of the this bundled or dependency plugins. So uh, it would get there anyway. So it, yeah, I, I sort of see it somewhat hard to implement how to actually get this get this pinned. But yeah, let's, you know, I guess that's definitely something that can be considered as a next step for ATH evolution. Um, but probably, and just to finish my thought, the reason I share this uh, contributing guide, there is this list of recognized use cases. So oftentimes when we get these discussions, um, you know, uh, people tend to forget what are the other use cases for the entire ATH and, you know, try to, you know, make things behave sane in the use cases they care for. So this is sort of a complete list of all the recognized use cases. So these kind of changes can be discussed without forgetting the other stuff. So, and I was not, I had never read that. I'm embarrassed to admit I'd never read that. I love the idea of recognized use cases as a way to remind us this repository has a purpose and these are the purposes that it's, it's addressing. Yeah. So refer to yeah i've introduced them at some point when you know the discussions went sideways because of reasons like that thanks for the question right so let me let me get through the doc to make sure that we're not forgetting anything. Um, what is the storage requirement? I wouldn't say that, you know, um, it's any way demanding. Um, it's sort of a CPU and memory demanding, as you can imagine, right? It's test suite, Jenkins, the browsers, you know, this um, um, Selenium. Uh, it all, it's got, all got its... Uh, uh, it's footprint, so it's somewhat memory and, uh, and CPU heavy, but I wouldn't say that much for, uh, uh, for storage. 
are there are there collision? Do you generally have them running with a dedicated display device associated with each test, or can they coexist on the same screen at one time? Is I, I'm not familiar with not familiar enough with Selenium runtime to be. You mean if you would like to run several of them in parallel in a single host? Right. Is that is that generally feasible, or no? It's rather you you they really need to be one in a, one on a host at a time. Um, the thing is that, you know, uh, from the nature of, um, of the UI testing, there is a plenty of waiting. It's very hard to write a test to be synchronous. And, uh, um, you know, there, there's a plenty of waiting when it's so, such a constrained environment to interact through UI. You click a link and you get to wait for page to be in, in the right environment. So there's a lot of waiting and obviously you know, a lot of timeout. So because this things doesn't happen in time, it can be a symptom of a problem, but at the same time can be just slowness or something like that. So uh, we ended up never to parallelize this on a single machine to avoid this to be uh, interacting with each other because there's quite a lot of uh, going on. Uh, so this can easily happen and be very, very unpredictable. So we've been getting more predictable results when we just avoided that and you know sacrificing some resources and parallelize across a number of, of systems. Um, but from the top of my head, I don't recall this would really be clashing or fighting over so over a particular display environment. Uh, what is real relevant for this is that there's a couple of modes how to execute this. I mean, how to execute the ATH and uh, when to specify a browser, which are somewhat noteworthy. Um, and I will do a sh very short detour to what these are. So the docs are all referenced from uh, from README. So there's a selecting a browser, which is sort of uh, misleading because it does not only specify where the browser is, but there's a couple of, um, I would say, more substantial differences. Presumably the Firefox and Chrome container. Um, so what these do is that they just wrap the old uh, frame buffer, this uh, XVNC and the Firefox inside a container. So, and if you run number of tests in parallel, they would get a, they separate containers for every test when the UI is running. So it would be hopefully impossible for them to clash. Okay, I'll be moving down the dock. Let's see what other questions do we have in there. The one that is next in the dock for me is the one on tables to divs, Jenkins 2, 264, 265, 266, and 267. I was expecting major breakage there. Have you seen major breaks from the, the UI changes that have been made beginning with 264? Honestly, I didn't have the, the resources to look into non-LTS results. Ah, okay. Good. So that's I okay. So that's good to know. That's a place that is a fertile field the rest of us can explore. Mm. Great. Okay. And and really, because 263 is the next LTS, we've still got three months before we will get into LTS on something that has tables to divs in it. So okay, great. That's a, a thing that, uh, I mean, I know this is a thing we are doing also on Cloud BSI, so trying to anticipate weekly is before the LTS is, is a continuous battle. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, do you mean the challenge of picking a reasonable weekly? Yeah, plus trying to actually use, for instance, you know, running everything on weeklies in advance and, and continuously to be able to not end up taking everything in the face, you know, at the last minute when the LTS baseline has been chosen finally. And mm -hmm. then, you know, executing every test at that moment, instead of having tried to fix them, you know, continuously every time, every week, every day, when things start to fail, uh, it's hard because it's actually a lot of work. And this ecosystem is huge, so yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, the entire ATH approach that uh, that I've been leading for years, um, the goal was just this, right? But it turned out to be, you know, so somewhat 
it required a consistent attention and, and work to be put into just keeping these tests up and running. And yeah. uh, historically, we've been quite short on, on cycles. And for reasons that are absolutely understandable, it wasn't very attractive for the people to actually join, help, you know, fixing, analyzing, resolving, and, uh, and situation like this. Okay, so let's have a look uh, at the rest so we can spend the time on the future of LTS testing. Um, who detects the failures, right? I guess we briefly covered that. So in the, in the upstream uh, upstream CI, it's pretty much whoever comes uh, comes around. Um, so that will be, you know, not necessarily the maintainers, but uh, whoever contributes to this. So I, I must say that CloudBees has been doing a lion's share of work in there. Uh, there's a quite a lot of people that have contributed, fixed, and uh, uh, and improved these tests as a time go. I also know that uh, Ulrich Hefner was working very hard on uh, on these, and uh, you know, uh, we did our part. So yeah, for the for the upstream, uh, I mean that's for you know just keeping the test suite healthy. When it comes to the LTS certification, that's the mailing list approach I described. So every four weeks there is an email that calls for uh, for contributors to report the problem from their private environment that might or might not uh, use ATH. Hmm. Uh, speaking of uh, failure investigation, um, well, for, for ATH only, um, uh, it's done in a way that it can be usually, you know, invoked on, uh, on Linux desktop. So there is also a way to run this locally. Again, the documentation is somewhat um, uh, somewhat complex uh, and elaborate on how to actually do this. But in pretty much vast majority of the cases, uh, we are able to rerun the tests locally, single tests and then iterate on that. So, uh, or even, you know, pause it and, and investigate. So fair part of that is, um, documented though I would say the specifics are beyond the scope of, uh, of this document so uh, right um, common failure modes uh, right I would say that the, uh, the UI change is one of the most common uh, failure mode which is sort of a contrapoint or you know uh, sort of a disadvantage of using the UI based verification um, another failure modes that are not so frequent are various changes in, in versioning, etc. where for whatever reason, when a tests are in ATH, it runs uh, with slightly different versions of plugins for, for some reason. Um, might, be, might be some dependencies, optional dependencies, or in the past, this uh, bundled plugins. So yeah, usually it's some sort of disparity between the state of the plugins and plugin ecosystem and ATH often the fact that the page objects of acceptance as harness and the UI of plugin are, you know, not compatible anymore, but it's not so that is. Right. Um, and speaking of uh, the duration, well, it's been a while since I actually seen this executed, you know, serially. But last time I checked, we was somewhere close to 12 hours. Uh, since then, we've done some, um, you know, some reduction, which is a project that kick started some, I guess, years ago, a year ago, when uh, we sort of, and I guess it's also in the contributing doc, um, sort of specify what tests does and what does not belong into the acceptance to harness. Um, let me see. Yeah, test contribution. So the idea is that, you know, while we're interested in having a reasonable coverage, we definitely cannot have tests for every plugin for all the use cases or even, you know, even thinking about the code coverage is close to insane given how expensive the, the test run is, how, how slow it is. So um, we sort of specified what is expected to be in and what is not. So tests for plugins that are don't have enough installations or there's just you know occupying too much uh, too much time we we'll try to reduce them or move them away which we partially partially succeeded um 
so again, the idea was um, to keep this sort of constrained and prevent the ATH from bloating. Uh, and, you know, hopefully keep the runtime and the scope and the amount of code in there um, reasonable and easier to maintain. Uh, but, you know, I guess for the reduction is still something desirable. So that would be the full runtime. Uh, so when it's running parallel, it's usually, well, what was it? We'll be using them, like something like 10 splits. So they usually fit into three hours. I mean, uh, the slowest one. There is, you know, it's not just 12 hours divided by by 10 in this case. So it's usually, you know, taking a lot longer than uh, than an ideal case, but this is roughly the time estimate. Right. Moving further, what types of issues does ATH certif certification detect? Um, that's a good point. Um, oftentimes, we run into the situation that this is an incompatibility. In I would say in a substantial majority of the cases, it's incompatibility between the test suite and uh, uh, and the plugin, you know, when the UI changes, users might be surprised or used to something else, but it's not necessarily, uh, you know, considered a regression from any, any reasonable standpoint, though the tests are going to break anyway. So uh, vast majority of the of the problems that LTS detects are these incompatibilities or some uh, some flakes in the uh, in the environment, which, you know, uh, no amount of effort we were able, ever able to dedicate to this resolved. So uh, I consider this to be inherent to, to the Selenium and the entire UI verification approach. Um, so the problem these do detect um, are usually something that, uh, well, I don't think that there is a particular category of issues that is detect that we would, you know, uh, we would highlight. So oh, when you say incompatibility, I, I like that one because there was a there's a current failure in a plugin I maintain that is due to a a loading prior to the plugin's own tests of a library that's older than the one that the plugin needs, and it's it's a valid it's a valid condition it's a valid case, and the solution is restart Jenkins after installing a test or after installing a plugin and. So it's those kinds of things that it, it surfaced those for you as well. It's not just me that's benefited from ATH finding that kind of that kind of challenge. Yeah, I was thinking along on this line, you know, I think from an LTS standpoint, it's hard to use typically the so-called PCT, plugin compatibility tester. But in the case you're mentioning, Mark, it might be that it's easier to use and less flaky or less, you know, full-blown thing Selenium related uh, because it's full Maven. So PCT is basically a, a thing that will look into your dependency tree and bump everything using the update JSON, the center data to, you know, use the latest and run MVN test the same way somehow. So it's going to be more Maven based than Selenium based. So probably a bit more stable, but I was thinking, you know, uh, yeah, on the cloud on, on the, the cloud B side is different, but indeed on the Jenkins side, we have uh, 1700 plugins plus uh, cloud counting. So we can't really run <laughs> 1700 PCT runs of Maven tests on everything constantly. Uh, well, the right way would be to actually do this on single plugins, but it's a, I don't know, it's a quality thing more than just an LTS thing, I guess. It's mm. much wider than just the LTS uh, subject, I guess. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
my you know visibility into the into the plugin compatible tester is practically nil though yeah what actually can help is you know drawing a line somewhere like for for this LTS we require at least one percent of all Jenkins installations need to have the plugin installed for it to be considered something that ATH is being run against which you know I guess it could eliminate a lot of these, you know, potential runs. So, you know, it depends on where we, where we put the put the bar. But yeah, we can focus on the most popular plugins or something like that. That's a good point. We could just use uh, obvious things like like uh, uh, non uh, sentiment based somehow things like you know last release date plus number of installs, uh, something like this, like a mix to to test the like you know. Like pipe, because basically, for instance, if Jenkins, if pipelines are broken, uh, Jenkins is moot. So, uh, yeah, we should probably do it. We, should, we probably want to detect it. Yeah, precisely. Right. Okay. So, is there anything else, uh, or we can have a look at this future of LTS testing? Hey, Oliver, yes, a, a brief summary regarding statistics, just to get a sense of for the, all the releases that you've been dealing with and leading. So how, how often do you see regressions? And mostly all when those regressions are based on the UI changes, just to have a, like a, you know, overall numbers that give us a sense of how is the, how is the releases behaving? Obviously it might change between releases, but as mm -hmm. an overall view might help me as well to understand. Um, right. Um, well, when it comes to the LTSs itself, I don't keep the keep the numbers, but from the uh, mailing list, we should be able to find it out. So it's like in every one in three or four, from my you know gut feeling uh, of the RC testing, we dis we discover something that something stopped working. Not always it requires further backporting. Sometimes it's just plugin that is incompatible or something that can be fixed on the side of a plugin and we get to rush it in, in you know, merging it and releasing it. Um, oftentimes it's a glitch that just happened and people need to do something, you know, reconfigure this, stop using that or something like that. So it's being uh, uh, documented into, into um, upgrade guy, uh, upgrade guide that we produce with every LTS. So Mark was doing a great job on composing these lately, um, you know, so, short warning or, or guidance for people what to do and what to change. So yeah, I would say that can be one in three, one in four requires something, right? Um, when it comes to the fail test, as I said, it's probably a vast majority of the failures that we observe uh, are some kind of incompatibilities or flukes. Um, this is somewhat given by, you know, what amount of time we actually preventively invest into the maintaining the ADH, right? I mean, if somebody would be looking at the, at the failures every day and working on, you know, one hour to actually fixing them, it's not that much of an allocation, but we keep, you know, we discover, we discover these incompatibilities fairly soon, it gets fixed and it doesn't pollute the, the statistics anymore, which is quite far from the reality of the past years. So uh, uh, you see quite a lot of issues that is being reported and vast majority of these are actually, you know, just plugin has diverged at some point and the ATH haven't been adjusted yet. Right, but still uh, the statistics does not, um, you know, uh, uh, are not very encouraging in this regard anyway, because the number of time that something needs to be touched is still something like, I don't know, like nine times in, Nine times in 10 when something breaks, it's just the incompatibility which is otherwise harmless. And one in these 10 cases would be, you know, uh, some actual bug or some actual problem. Right. So uh, thanks for the questions. That was really, really good. Um, we discovered, uh, you know, a lot, lot of things I didn't even thought of, of covering. So definitely, definitely helped me to, to completing this. And uh, thank you, Mark, on helping to capture all this in, um, in docs. So that's a good job done there. Um, I focused, I mean, I suggested a couple of things that should be done in, uh, in the 
in the future of, of LTS testing with ATH or not. Um, one of them we briefly scratched that uh, would be the simplification and reduction to cut, you know, uh, runtime, to cut resources, to cut the feedback time, right? If, you know, one of the reasons why we don't do this as a part of uh, PR testing is that we probably don't want to wait three hours for a pull request to get a green light, even if this would be all stable and, and all that. So that's one of the, uh, one of the, you know, possible ways to go, though the improvement there is on the linear, right? Even if we just sacrifice half of the tests or make them running twice as fast, it still get from, you know, three hours to one and a half, which, and it would be a heck of an effort to, to actually get there. So it's sort of questionable to, you know, it, yeah, it's a linear improvement, I guess I've said it all. Um, another thing is that what we do, um, with ATH is becoming less and less relevant to modern Jenkins. Uh, simply we are testing the UI both, I mean, you know, to pulling data from it or, or observing it is still, still, you know, uh, valid as ever before, though configuring it and clicking through the UI in order to put things in there, mostly configuration is becoming less and less, uh, you know, popular use case. Um, so that's another thing to, to consider how to actually, I mean, this is, you know, what we're encouraging user to do. And, you know, speaking for Red Hat, this is what we are pushing very, very hard on to actually get uh, every internal user of Jenkins away to actually get it configured without touching anything. Uh, so, you know, uh, the complexity of putting things in Jenkins forms through page objects is just immense. And, you know, ideally should be used less and less every year. So, one other thing is that I believe it's not putting enough enough empathy, sorry, <laughs> enough empathy on uh, on JCask and job DSL configuration. You know, simply the UI is not uh, as used as before. So that's something that uh, I guess it would benefit and make this a lot more a uh, lot more relevant. And also, um, it's just verifying the the war file. I mean, there's a couple of other ways how to how to run this. It's also configurable. But what we are, I guess. Uh, only focusing is how the Jenkins var is running, but not necessarily how it's running in, inside of a Jenkins container, which again, sorry, I don't have the numbers at the hand, but yeah, I guess it's just, you know, uh, being used more and more often. And that's probably something we would like to verify. Maybe as well, but eventually switching to this almost exclusively. I forgot to ask earlier, is there any execution on Windows? I assume this is all Linux based. Is that is that correct? Um, this is all Linux based. There were okay. fixes and improvements coming from uh, James in the past. So I guess he might have more information. Um, so sort of no investment done from us uh, on Windows. We, you know, obviously work with the uh, contributors and uh, try to make sure that this is uh, this is running. but. It just runs on Windows. He likes to suffer, so that's that's. Uh... <laughs> but yeah, that's probably why he is is the one pushing the most fixes specific for Windows because I don't think we have a lot of others running Windows, if at all. Mm -hmm. is... I mean, on the dev, dev machine even. Mm -hmm. Is Cloud is interested in this use case as a part of business? You mean running things on Windows? Uh, on agents, definitely. On masters, yes. <laughs> like you see the gradient, uh, uh, but we do not recommend it. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, controllers on Windows should be, uh, yeah, a discouraged setup as far as I think we do. We put in our KBs, but don't quote me on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's you know fairly similar. So yeah. I Actually, not that it would be not doable, but it's definitely not straightforward how to get ATH run on Linux and get only the controllers on Windows. Right, which, you know, if there is any Windows use case, it would be this one. I see. So, um, you know, as I said, uh, I've been running this project for Jesus six, seven years, I guess, quite a lot. And honestly, it's been a back, back burner for a, 
vast majority of that time. So definitely there are things to improve. Uh, definitely do not hesitate to reach to me. I would be more than happy to provide my guidance and experience of what can be done with this. And, uh, you know, I'm currently in a state that I'm almost certain that something needs to be done with this uh, for partially the reason that I've already mentioned. Um, so, yeah, I'm, uh, I was glad that, uh, you know, the PCT was mentioned, which I was looking at a possible um, alternative, maybe I'm not going to say replacement, but a possible thing to converge to, to actually figure out how exactly they would like to uh, certify the LTS. And uh, also, and this was really more of a wild idea rather than anything else. And uh, that's composing something utterly different based on container, JCASC, job DSL, and some other form of verification, which would be prone of Selenium, which would hopefully save us some of the problems and it would resolve uh, the thing that, you know, configuration through UI is becoming less and less relevant. Whether that would be, you know, verification through some Ruby scripts, which feels sort of white boxy and not quite nice, but, or alternatively using this HTTP client, what is it called, Jenkins, not Jenkins, CLI, you know, using the HTTP client for, for Jenkins that is based in Java to actually, very, you know, start build, verifying states, getting logs and things like that. So that's more of a wild idea how to, how to advance further and avoid a lot of the hassle that we currently have. I mean, that we always had with Selenium. Oliver, thank you very much. We've used your hour of time. Is there anything else you want to advise us as we conclude here? Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Yeah, folks, definitely. Thanks a lot. You know, you brought quite a lot of interesting questions. The thing is, um, as I said, I would like somebody else to take this over for now. So I guess it would be the number of uh, contributors we currently have. Uh, if James would like to step in and becoming the, the main maintainer, I would be more than happy. Um, it's not that I'm leaving for good. I should still be around, still can help with things and provide some guidance and, and some historical contents, context if that's desirable. So I should still be available to do that. Great. Well, and, and just to share, Gareth Evans, who is on the call, is has agreed to take on a piece of this as part of his responsibility in the Jenkins community team or in the community team at CloudView. So Gareth has the unfortunate privilege of reporting to me and therefore he gets to he gets to listen as I try to guide and steer. So you, you will probably be pinged by Gareth or by me as we look at how should this evolve. Cool. Speaking of unfortunate privileges, Gareth, do you own an X? Is it the big one? <laughs> it's not that big, unfortunately. Right. I'll get a new. I'll get a new one. <laughs> yeah. I've known less lucky guy than you know. You're really referring to Mark, who's an adorable person. We all know. So yeah. <laughs> Anything else, Oliver? Not for me, guys. All right. Thanks, everyone. I will post the recording after it's processed. The recording usually processing takes on the order of 30 minutes or an hour. I'll also place a link to the recording and to these notes in a comment to the Jenkins developers list so we have them archived. Thanks everybody very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect, thank you Mark. Thank you.